Hello, in this video I'm going to be talking about parallelism and we're going to be doing some examples on this for the next couple lectures. Um, so parallelism is a fancy word for doing multiple things at one time. And, um, and so I'm going to be talking more about what that looks like. There's going to be a bunch of other related words that we're going to learn um, here. Some that you've seen before. Um, we're going to learn about thread, process you've seen before. Uh, we've mentioned instruction pointers before, but they're going to get a lot more focus now. We're going to learn about the state of a thread or process. Um, we're going to learn, learn a little more about uh, CPUs. Uh, we're going to learn about graphics processing units, which turns out can do a lot more than graphics these days. And then finally, we're going to learn about this notion of a core, which shows up in both CPUs and GPUs. So to start, uh, I want to build a little bit of a mental model um, about how processes normally run on a CPU. And then I'm going to show you two problems that can uh, kind of crop up when we're running code. And, and these have to do with wasting uh, compute resources. And then we're going to show how we can solve these two problems with parallelism. And there's different kinds of parallelism. There's uh, thread parallelism, process parallelism, and then uh, GPU parallelism. And uh, I'm going to explain what each of those are. Uh, and then we're going to forget about thread parallelism. We're not going to do anything else with it in this course. I mean, really, that could be a topic for a whole semester. Uh, but we're going to do a little bit more with uh, kind of multiple processes and, um, and how to use GPUs. OK, so mental model. First, uh, we want to think about uh, tasks or threads. Uh, you might call them in cores. And, um, and so let's try to tie this into something we know. Um, here I have some example Python code on the left and some data on the right. And there's that little red arrow oh, that's kind of pointing to whatever line of code we're currently executing. That's what we're currently doing. And that notion of like what are we currently doing uh, shows up everywhere, not just in Python. It shows up at the machine level where we're kind of operating at these uh, the level of instructions that the CPU understands. Um, and that little red arrow in general is called an instruction uh, pointer. I think is a nice term for it. Other people might call it a program counter. You might hear that if you're uh, reading elsewhere, it means the same thing. But that instruction pointer tells us, well, what are we currently doing? And as far as we've been concerned, there's always been one instruction pointer. And that's going to change today, where I see lots of instruction um, pointers. Now, the way we've seen things working so far is that the code and the data is bundled up together in, in something called a process. And uh, within that process, that instruction pointer uh, belongs to a thread. And we've never seen an example when we're running code where we don't have exactly one process and one, one thread, right? So it might kind of seem like the uh, instruction pointer is tied to the process, but that's not going to be true going forward. We might see cases where there's multiple uh, threads inside of a single process. Okay, so we have that, that thread there, which has this instruction pointer. And, um, and I might have many different uh, processes running on my machine. Here I have processes one, two, three, and four. Um, in those parentheses, after the process name, uh, I say what the program name is. So remember that uh, a process is just a running program. And, um, and so here I actually have three different programs. I have programs P, Q, and R. And um, this P program, I actually, you can see that I started it twice. Um, you know, there's different ways I could do that. Maybe the most obvious is that I just open up two terminal windows and I'm running the same program uh, twice at the same time. And so you can see those two different, um, the threads for those two different processes, they have the instruction pointers at different places, right? There's no need that uh, for that two processes and different terminals to be running in sync with each other. Okay, so I have all these processes. Uh, they all have the instruction pointer because they all have this one thread. And, uh, and I have a CPU and um, the CPU is uh, not just any CPU, it's a multi-core processor, uh, it's kind of CPU. And on there, I actually have two different, um, what we call cores, which are really many CPUs. You know, it's a little bit of a, the complexity in the language here, right? Sometimes people refer to the whole chip as a CPU. Sometimes people refer to a core on, on the whole chip as a, as a CPU. So I'll just probably generally use CPU to refer to the whole thing and, uh, and core to refer like the miniature CPU on, on the bigger CPU. Okay, so here I have this CPU, there's two cores on it, and uh, at any given time, those two cores can each be associated with at most one, one thread, right? So here, I see that those two cores are associated with the threads for process one and process two. And, and so I'm saying over here on the right that that means process one and two um, are currently running 
and um, processes three and four are ready. They, there's no reason they couldn't be running, except that we don't have enough CPUs for them uh, right now, and we've allocated our CPUs elsewhere. Right? So, so this middle model, right, every process is either uh, running or, or ready. And, um, and when you're running, what does that mean? That means that uh, your instruction pointer is moving, right? It's moving over instructions and executing code. Um, if you're not running, uh, that means your um, instruction pointer is just sitting still until you get a CPU. So now, now I see that these two have a CPU. And so I see that um, process three gets to move forwards. Notice actually, let me just go back a slide. You see what's happening between these two slides? Um, uh, making progress doesn't always mean the instruction pointer goes forward. If I have a loop or something like that, uh, maybe doing work means that the instruction pointer goes back to that happened with process one. So process one is doing some sort of loop. So anyway, those two are running now and it, it could keep switching between these and, uh, and then running other ones, right? So the more cores we have in our CPU, the more tasks or, um, or maybe I'm gonna use this word threads we can run simultaneously. Okay. So let me show you two problems that can um, happen now that you have this mental model. And these have to do with wasting compute resources. Um, so one problem is that maybe I only have one process running and I have more cores, right? So what happens to extra cores? Uh, they get wasted because, um, you know, I wish I could somehow use that other extra core to help this process, but I can't. It only has one thread, which means it only has one instruction pointer. So I'm just wasting this core. Another problem I could have is that the code that may be running may require waiting for a while. Um, so for example, let's say I have a file open and I'm doing like a, a file.read. Maybe I have to wait for some data to be pulled from the hard drive, that might take a while. Uh, there's nothing for the CPU to do while that's happening. Um, when, when that's happening, we say that the process is in a blocked state or the thread is in a blocked state, right? So, um, so it's not ready to run and it's not running. Once it gets done waiting for whatever it's waiting for, then it'll go back to being ready and then maybe, maybe the CPU will start running that uh, code again. Um, other things that might do this, um, if I'm trying to do a network request, maybe I'm saying request.get to download from some URL, I may have to wait for that. Um, really, I could be bringing this upon myself. If I call time.sleep, uh, then we have to wait until that amount of time uh, returns before we're ready to run this process again. Okay, so those are the two problems. Let me just go back in. So problem one is that maybe I have more cores uh, than I have work. And then the second problem is maybe uh, maybe I have lots of, of kind of processes running and threads, uh, but they're waiting, right? So either way, I end up wasting resources. Okay, so the solution to this is parallelism. We wanna write our programs and, and so they kind of are, consist of these independent parts that can be worked on at the same time. And, uh, and, and there's three really important ways to do that. One is thread level parallelism. We introduce it first, but uh, not going into a lot of detail. Um, and then what we'll talk about more is process level parallelism and GPU parallelism. So let's start with the hard one and get it out of the way. So with thread level parallelism, we can have multiple threads per process. And remember that each thread has its own instruction pointer. So I get this picture on the left uh, where I have my code and my data, and I have all these different instruction pointers and they're all running at the same time. And if that sounds complicated, it's because it is, right? It's very hard to reason about um, and get right. And, and, and you know, very good programmers struggle to get this right. Um, so when I'm doing this though, let's say I have this running like this, that will usually help with two things. One is that I can have one process that's using uh, more than one core, right? So, so for example, maybe right now, um, even though I have one process, I'm putting these thread IDs in the, in the bottom right. So I can see that threads one and two are running, right? Um, other thing that I can do is uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps um, one of my threads is blocked, okay? Uh, right, maybe it's doing a read or whatever. Um, well, that's okay because I probably have some other threads that aren't blocked, right? Maybe I can work on those for a while. Um, so I might want uh, more, if I have a bunch of threads and they're all doing IO, I would probably want to have more threads than I have CPUs, so that the ones that are waiting, it's fine that they wait. There's always other work to be done. So this is kind of true of programming in general. These are the two benefits of threads. Uh, but 
Python is actually kind of a special case. Um, in Python, uh, you can certainly create threads, and I'm going to do that, that in this video, uh, but you cannot have uh, multiple threads running at the same time. Right? So, so this does not help with this using multiple cores. The only reason to have multiple threads in Python is so you could do, do you still do useful work for the process while some of the threads are, are blocked on, say, network requests or, or maybe reading files. Okay, so let me, let me um, run a code example here. I'm going to copy this. Here I have some threads. Let me, let me head over to my, um, to my Jupyter and uh, let, me, let me create a new Jupyter notebook. Um, I'm going to paste this example and, and let me just try to switch this up here a little bit. First, I'm going to start with something that doesn't have threads that we're very familiar with. Um, so what's happening here, I have this function f, um, it, it takes this name, which is going to be a string, and some number n, and, um, and then we're looping from 0 to n minus 1, and each time, as i is drawing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, we're going to print n minus i, so I'll print n, n minus 1, n minus 2, and each time we do that print, uh, we're going to sleep for one second, All right, so it's kind of counting down one second at a time. And so I'm going to do this first with A, and then with B, and, and I, my understanding is that it should take 8 seconds about to run this code. A equals 3, A equals 2, A equals 1, B5, B4, B3, B2, and then B1. Okay, so nothing fancy there, right? This is uh, hopefully familiar. Um, let me try doing this with threads. And uh, when we're doing threads, I can be running the same function twice, uh, at the same time, okay? And when it's sleeping, right, maybe the CPU runs the other thread. And so I'm going to get rid of this and go to this more complicated version. Uh, in this more complicated version, I'm taking creating two threads called T1 and T2. And uh, when I create them, I have to pass in a reference to the function I want to run, which is F. And then I have to pass in a tuple of arguments uh, that I want to get passed in, right? So I create these two threads, and and you know what? If I just if I do it like this, nothing happens. Um, but if I th start the threads, and I start running, and then this thing down here, join at the end, means that it needs to wait until they finish running, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. So it's gonna finish running when this function returns. I'm gonna do this, and now I see two are running at the same time, right? And then B is still running. A is already done. See the difference? This function, right, is running twice at the same time, once when it had A passed in, and once when it had B passed in. Okay. That's the only example I'm going to do in this course for, for this. Uh, my recommendation is don't use threads in your program unless you learn a lot more about them uh, than we're going to teach in this, in this course, right? There's lots of things that can go wrong, um, and you have to learn about kind of threads and locking and other things uh, to get it right. Okay, uh, let's talk about process level parallelism and GPU parallelism. So here I, I am, I have like one process running, and um, so this is process one, and it was started from program Q. I have Q in the parentheses, and it's running on a core. And, um, and let's say I want to take advantage of some more, some more CPU cores. What this program or this process can do is it can make a clone of itself. And it could actually make a lot of clones of itself if it wants. And, um, and it turns out on Linux, this is actually a very efficient thing to do. I'm not trying to get into the details of it. Um, it might look like there's four copies of the data, um, and it feels like they are in terms of the code that's running, but it's not really wasting uh, that much memory to do that. I won't get into the details of why. But anyway, this, this uh, process made kind of these duplicates or clones of itself. And they were all kind of running at the same place. You can see instruction pointers at the same place for each of them. And I have these four processes, and they're all running uh, the Q program, right? And um, and so maybe the CPUs run processes two and three a bit, and maybe they run uh, two and four a bit, and maybe they do some other stuff. And eventually, each of these processes finished whatever work they were supposed to do. And, um, and at least in Python, a common pattern is that they'll send the data, uh, their output data, 
uh, back to the program that, or the, I'm not sorry, not, the, they'll send their data back to the process that created them. Uh, that's their parent. Uh, process one is the parent of uh, of the clones of itself, which is kind of strange, right? But uh, these processes two, three, and four can send all their beta, data back to process one, which can combine it in, in some way. And so we had an advantage because even though we end up with one process at the end, uh, maybe for a while we were doing a lot of uh, heavy computational work. And so splitting it across these multiple processes allowed us to use uh, multiple CPU cores, right? So those will finish and, and then, then everything is good. And, um, and so I'm not gonna do examples in this video. I'm gonna save that for the next video. Uh, but, but there's some nice documentation here. It's in this multi-processing library, uh, which is built into Python. And so you can go do that. And, um, and, and it's relatively simple. There's other functions we've learned before in, in the previous course, like map. And, uh, and we're gonna be able to make map faster by kind of uh, easily splitting up pieces of work across multiple process it, processes. Okay, let's talk about graphics processing units. Uh, graphics processing units were of course originally built uh, for graphics. Um, and uh, it turns out that the needs of graphics are a little bit different than regular computation. Uh, with regular computation on a CPU, uh, we need to be very flexible. There's different things that we might need to be uh, done. Uh, usually we won't have a ton of processes running, so a few fast cores that are very flexible um, is good. It's good if those um, uh, different processes can work independently of each other, so they can be running completely different programs. Um, in contrast, graphics tend to be um, a little bit repetitive, right? I mean, you can imagine on your screen, there's all these pixels you have to fill in, and maybe there's a lot of kind of repetitive work to figure out what should be shown on the screen. And, uh, and so these have evolved differently. Rather than trying to have a few fast, flexible uh, cores, uh, graphics cards have optimized for having uh, many cores, maybe thousands of cores rather than you know a dozen. And, um, and they're, they're kind of optimized for dealing um, with floating point numbers, right? They aren't good at integers or strings so much as they are at kind of these uh, operations on floats. And, um, and, and they're coordinated, right? They can't have all these, even though we have a lot of cores, um, often many of the cores are gonna be kind of chained together and, uh, and doing the kind of the same task at the same, at the same time, okay? Now it turns out that this kind of workload where I'm doing a bunch of kind of uh, redundant uh, number crunching um, is good for other things than graphics. It's great for a lot of scientific computing applications. Uh, for kind of doing large scale linear algebra. And, um, and that's why it's gonna be useful for us and kind of for machine learning in general. Um, let, let me just highlight a little bit more kind of the restrictions or limitations we have with a GPU. Uh, even if we're using a GPU in our program, um, we have to write code that's running on the CPU. Every program does that. And, um, and often, you know, the vast majority of the time, GPUs have a separate place for their memory uh, than RAM, right? RAM is kind of where most of the data is living most of the time that uh, is being used by our process running on the CPU. And so what this means is that we're gonna have to uh, in explicitly decide that we wanna move certain data back and forth between the GPU. Uh, that's not a lot of work, but we actually have to make a, a method call to do that. And, um, and so maybe, for example, maybe I have a big NumPy a matrix and um, maybe I kind of bundle that up in the right way and I can uh, say, hey, I wanna move this matrix over to the GPU to do some linear algebra, okay? Now, the other thing that's gonna be uh, weird is I talked about how there's all these cores that are tied together. Uh, maybe the clearest uh, mental picture is that we imagine that there's some code on the GPU and, uh, and there's all these instruction pointers that are pointing to the same line of code at, at the same, same time, right? So kind of all these threads are in lockstep with each other. And, uh, and it, it's kind of okay because in, our, in terms of our data, our data is broken up into chunks, right? So maybe even though um, you know, all of these uh, kind of steps are being run at the same time, maybe they're uh, operating on different pieces of the data. So maybe when I run it, like, well, okay, maybe they all move to the next step, but they all operate on a different part um, of, of that data set. And depending on the GPU, um, it, I, I don't want to go so far as to say that all the threads are, are kind of tied together in lockstep, uh, but large groups of them uh, will be. Large groups will have to coordinate together. So it's not nearly as flexible 
um, as a CPU. So there's one case we've already seen where this is super useful, and that's matrix multiplication. Um, so let's say I'm multiplying a matrix by a vector, right? You can see on the left here. Uh, the matrix, right, I can think of it as a bunch of rows, each of which have, well, I guess how many numbers does each row have? Um, I'm multiplying by a vector of size three, and that vector is vertical. Um, so I guess each each row there must also have three numbers in it, right? So I have I have n rows and three columns, and I, I'm multiplying that matrix by that vector, and um, and I get a bunch of outputs, and then each output is um, is just one number, right? So so how do I do that? I can do it row by row. I multiply row one of ma the matrix by the vector, then I multiply row two of the matrix by the vector, and then I multiply row three of the matrix by the vector. You see, it's very redundant, and that's perfect for a GPU, right? Because um, you could imagine, in, in a bit of a simplification, maybe all of these threads on the GPU are working on a different row of my matrix, right? I can, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't have to like find the answer of row one before I can work on row two. I can work on all the rows at the same time and, uh, and, and I'm doing the same calculation in each case. So this is really an ideal use case uh, for the GPU. Um, and, and the code for this is relatively simple. So we're gonna be learning this new uh, package called PyTorch. Here's an example of some PyTorch code. Um, it turns out that uh, NVIDIA, who kind of uh, spearheaded this movement towards using GPUs for scientific computing, uh, they, they kind of called their programming model CUDA, uh, which stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. And so in this code, you can see I'm, um, uh, I'm making these calls to, to CUDA, to CUDA. That means I'm trying to move some data uh, to uh, GPU. Uh, what exactly am I uh, moving to the GPU? Well, I'm using this torch package to create something called a tensor from a NumPy array, right? So I can use torch to uh, create these tensor objects from NumPy and then shove them over the GPU. Um, and then I can see that I'm saying B equals A dot product X. That computation is done on the GPU, so it's gonna be fast. And then finally I say B equals B dot to CPU. So I'm moving uh, the code back to the CPU and, and then printing it out. Okay, so uh, we'll be um, giving more examples of this uh, of this in the near future.